people say anything at all. Since I came to power, the budget of the Republic has always been an open book. Not so. The budget of the Republic has never been an open book. One person, though, who does know something about it is Nguza Carly Bond, who, a few years back, served as foreign minister and prime minister to Mobutu. Today, he lives in comfortable, self-imposed exile in Belgium. His aim, he says frankly, is to replace Mobutu. In the eight months I was prime minister, he has taken from the National Bank uh, a one billion Belgian franc, which is roughly 35 at that time. At that time, it was 35 million dollars. A few years back, it could never happen today, some opposition deputies were able to piece together a report from government documents claiming to show how Mobutu's family and friends were ransacking the country's treasure. One of them, who according to this report, profited most, was the president's Uncle Lito, who got the equivalent of about $35 million in one year. And there were lots of others, with their individual yearly takes running to hundreds of thousands of Belgian francs apiece. It's all family. It's a large family. Mobutu is also a big spender. On one occasion, he donned a cowboy hat, chartered the Concorde, and invited a hundred friends to visit Disney World with him. Cost of the trip, two million dollars. One of the sources of Mobutu's huge wealth has been his country's minerals. Do I understand that, that uh, cobalt, diamonds, and so forth are sent directly to Europe on chartered aircraft, and this is money that goes into his account without ever going into government accounts? This is one of the techniques. Another technique Mobutu has used to line his pockets, according to his critics, has been to encourage foreign powers, foreign companies, foreign banks to finance huge projects for Zaire. Example, a $100 million TV radio complex, the voice of Zaire, too big and sophisticated for the country. Today, most of its equipment doesn't even work. The former prime minister says, he knows who really benefited from the project. The French made money, and those who were, who were bribed. Those who were bribed because uh, uh, five or ten percent of it went into those who negotiated, the official, the Iranian official who negotiated the project. The French also made millions from this World Trade Center in downtown Kinshasa, packed with the latest technology. But the air conditioning system doesn't work. So almost all the tenants have moved out. Useless. C can you imagine? Uh, I, I could understand that Japan, or oh, United States, or France, uh, use a World Trade Center because uh, they need to have international communication for trade. Zaire. The list continues. A half mile long bridge built by the Japanese, inaugurated with a celebration to match its size. But the port it was supposed to serve and the railroad it was designed to carry are years away from being built. The Italian sold Zaire, a sophisticated steel mill that doesn't churn out a ton of steel today. But the biggest white elephant of all is the huge Inga hydroelectric complex and transmission line, which cost more than a billion dollars and today operates at only 20% of capacity. $400 million of that cost was guaranteed by the U.S. Export-Import Bank. How do Mobutu and his cronies benefit from many such projects? They are said to exact a fee of between 5 and 10 percent on such undertakings. That is traditional in tribal Africa. But Erwin Blumenthal says Mobutu and his clique are greedier than that. If Mobutu and his clique would stay to 5 to 10 percent, okay, but no. It's much bigger than that. <laughs> you can say that again. When all of these projects were undertaken, copper prices high, cobalt prices high, diamonds in good shape. So it was understandable that businessmen from the West would say, hey, here's Bonanza. We can make some money and we can build a showcase in the center of black Africa. You've got it, exactly. And unfortunately, copper went down, cobalt went down, diamonds went down. So somebody made a bad guess. That was the West, the Western banks, and that's their problem now. Zaire has f more than five billion debt. Zaire cannot repay it because of the situation inside the country. 
Mobutu has also run into the ground many once prosperous businesses that had been owned by foreigners, but which he nationalized and then turned over to family and friends. His uncle Lito, for instance, was given his food importing firm. Today it no longer operates. Inside it looks like a junkyard. But Uncle Lito did not go broke. Among his many assets, this handsome villa on the outskirts of Brussels. U.S. Congressman Howard Volpe is chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa. The economy is falling apart. There have been so many investments that have not been, that have not made a contribution, that have diverted resources away from activities that would have really helped to develop the agricultural sector, to sustain the economy, feed the population. Example, just a short distance from Zaire's $100 million television complex is Mamayemo Hospital. Once one of the best hospitals in black Africa, today its equipment is broken down, flies swarm over garbage in the courtyard. The hospital is simply unable to provide many of the most basic services. The rate of child mortality here and throughout Zaire is staggering. You should see the people, they are really starving slowly to death. Once it was so rich that they, uh, in agriculture, they exported grain. Today they are waiting for the help from the United States so that people can survive. Everything that is said, that is written in the press, is done to destabilize us, to run us down. You know the history of Zaire since its beginning. We became independent under impossible conditions. There were not even five university graduates when the country became independent. And for five and a half, almost six years, there was chaos and anarchy. And today, the same people who did not prepare Zaire for its independence are now the first to criticize, to say anything at all. He has built this country into, into a country there wasn't any such thing in the minds of any Zairean or Congolese. Sheldon Vance was U.S. ambassador to Zaire from 1969 to 1974. He uh, had to deal with, with, a, with a situation where his people still had no sense of a, of a nation. Uh, the traditions of leadership were the traditions of tribal leadership. His goal has been, and I think to a considerable extent he has succeeded, to become the tribal chief of the whole country. It all belongs to him it, effectively. It all belongs to him effectively. And uh, the difference between the privy and the public purse is, is, is a difference that, uh, that is very difficult for them to, to seize and understand. So it's not corruption as we know it. It's, it's the way the game is played. It's the way the game is played, exactly. Zaire belongs to him. There you are. Because Zaire doesn't belong to him. Zaire belongs to only 30 million Zairean. You're painting a picture of a rather benign patron, tribal chief. Who is a, who is a tough guy, too. Tough in what sense? He's tough in, in insisting on recognition of his leadership role. There can only be one leader, says he, in a tribe or a country. And if you decide that you're going to be opposition, loyal or otherwise, you run into trouble. Case in point, last year, 12 Zairean legislators, opponents of Mobutu, went to the Intercontinental Hotel in Kinshasa to meet with some visiting U.S. congressmen, including Mickey Leland of Texas. They wanted to form an opposition party, which constitutionally, by the way, is illegal in Zaire. Afterwards, Congressman Leland happened to be watching from the hotel entrance as the opposition deputies left. The deputies were set upon by plainclothes police. One guy had been thrown to the ground, as I said, by his tie. And several people were just kicking him and stomping him he was, while he was bleeding profusely from his uh, forehead. And I just saw blood going everywhere. Had I interfered, uh, I probably would have been killed. What about the attitude, what about the actions of the U.S. Embassy in Zaire? They tried to gloss over what we had seen there. And they, their representation to us was that this, is, this happens all the time, so don't be so concerned that this is nothing compared to what used to happen, that kind of thing. Why is he important to the United States? Why do we pay this kind of attention? Why is he he's, our ally? He's been a, a reasonably successful leader of one of the most important countries in black Africa. And anti-communism. And anti-communist. And if he's a Somoza or if he's a Shah, He's, they're, they're better than Khomeini's.
what would happen if IMF, World Bank, U.S. banks suddenly said, enough. Enough, Zaire. Enough, Mobutu. We're through. Well, people would finally, uh, they would die in that country. It would be, it would be a revolution. It would be a bath and blood. They cannot stop now. At some point, President Mobutu will not be there question we need to ask ourselves in terms of our long-term interest in Zaire, and Zaire is an important country, is how will the rest of the population respond to the United States subsequently? Mm -hmm. Are we going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy in which uh, we will effectively be creating a hostile regime, hostile to American interest in the long term? I don't want to see that happen. I don't think Americans want to see that happen. The people are starving now. The misery of the people will be the best argument, not only against Mobutu, but also against Mobutu's ally, because the perception of the people is that the Mobutu's ally are accomplices for their mis misery and their starvation. And what will happen? The wild revolution or a wild, wild revolt will be something against Mobutu, but also against the West. He's been there a long time. That's right. That was the case of Amin, more than 10 years. Then was the case, that was the case of Bukasa, more than 10 years. They all finished the same way. Exile, prison, or death. Listen, it's not power for power's sake, but the love that I have for my people, this attachment. As we have the habit of saying in Zaire, it is a complicity that exists between the people and the chief. It is not power for power's sake, but I like to rule. Why try to hide it? I like to rule.